Hello everyone, my name is Chris Murphy and I'm an Unreal Engine Evangelist and today we're going to be taking a tour through Niagara which is Unreal Engine's latest visual effects system. It's a pretty powerful tool and honestly it's actually been in the editor for a little while but it's previously been considered early access and it's only now that it's considered something that is for general consumption and product release. So because we're going into uh, production with this, uh, it's a good idea to start kind of setting out how things work, how it's all set up, and how you can get started with Niagara. Now, to begin with, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to my content browser. I'm going to go to content, and I'm going to right click, and I'm going to go to FX. Now, I know I haven't done much, but this is actually where a lot of people kind of make their first slip up. And what I mean by that is there's a lot there. There's dynamic input scripts, there's effect types, emitters, functions, modules, parameters, and the system itself. And the truth is, is if you're just learning Niagara for the first time, ignore all of these just for the time being and just focus on a Niagara system. Now I'm going to open up a Niagara system and I'm going to make this one that's from selected emitters. Now, this is going to make a little bit more sense once I go into it. I could be making them from templates and using things like simple explosion bases and things like that. But the truth is, is for demonstrating it, I feel like it's a little bit easier for me to start with something a bit cleaner. So I'm going to create a new system that's empty using an empty emitter. And I'm just going to add that. And I'm going to click finish. And I'm going to call this ns underscore spinning particles. Now with ns underscore spinning particles, this is what we see. So this here is the emitter. And in theory, I could add as many of these as I wanted. So if I wanted to kind of copy that and have another one, you know, I could have multiple emitters stacked up. I'm not going to be doing that for this presentation though. Now how it works is this. Every single one of these sections executes the modules that are beneath it. So when the emitter spawns, it would execute code that would be there. When it's updated, it's going to have stuff here. And every particle, when they're spawned, will execute this. And every particle, every tick, will update and execute this. So let's go ahead and add some and see what it does. I'm going to go to my emitter update, and I'm going to add one called spawn rate. Now spawn rate is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to tell it to spawn 400 particles. And you'll notice that we get one very bright dot in the middle, and this is spawning 400 per second. Now, the reason that we're seeing one giant bright dot is because what we're actually seeing right now is every single particle in the exact same location. So watch what happens if I go to my particle spawn and I add a module to this group. I'm going to add, just for demonstration, a sphere location. And we can now see that this particle system is actually spawning those dots in a sphere at that spot. And that's great. So let's have a look at what particle update would do. So let's say I wanted to add some force to it. I could, for instance, add a vortex force. Now, when I added that, we see an issue on the right hand side. Now, the issue that's popped up is that the module has unmet dependencies. So what's actually happening here is we're adding vortex force, but that force isn't being applied because Niagara lets you kind of stack all of these forces together and then at the very end kind of add them to the final position. So what actually needs to happen is this solve forces and velocity module needs to be placed lower than my vortex force. Now I could just click fix issue and we'll do our best job to kind of fit it. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a gravity force. Once again, I'm just going to put this above my solve forces. And we can see that when I add the gravity force, those particles are just falling. Now, I don't really want the gravity to kick in that much. So let's just have just a little bit. So over time, they kind of slowly make their way down. Nothing too fancy. And the final thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to add, I'm going to add a point attraction force. Now, point attraction force can just pull things in towards it. So if I was to say, a 400 meter radius, and I want to have an attraction force of, say, 5. We can now see that some of these particles are kind of pulling their way back in. Now, at any point, I could look at this, and I could get it, and I could just drop this into the world. And we can actually see the system live here. 
Now, all right, this is kind of cool. Uh, nothing too fancy, but you know, uh, it's worth noting though that everything I've done so far isn't really anything that's outside of what you could have achieved in Unreal's existing system, Cascade. So let's do something a little bit more interesting. This time around, I'm gonna add a color node. Now, a color node seems straightforward. I can select here, I can give it a color, it is now that color. But what's great with a color node, or any of these nodes really, is that any input, you can actually click on this little arrow and add what's called a dynamic input. So what that means is if I wanted, I could do something like, I could draw this color from a curve. Now, let's say I want the particles to start white, okay? And then after a little bit of their life, I want them to then turn red. You can now see that at some point in their life, they're then turning red. And now let's say that I wanted after they turn red, I want to stay red for a while, and then I want them to turn green. Let's do a really vibrant green as well. Now, if I go back into the world, we can see that they start red, and after a bit of time, they eventually come out this. Now, this isn't too amazing, don't get me wrong, but what's important to note when it comes to this is that this is pulling its information from normalized age, which means that when it's at the end of its life, it has a value of one, and it's referencing this part of the color. And when it's at the beginning of its life, it's got a value of zero, and it's referencing this part of the color. Now, the reason that's important is that, once again, this value here, I could run my own dynamic input. For instance, maybe instead of using the normalized age, we want to use the distance uh, as a normalized range. So I could actually say, hey, get me the distance between the particle's position and the simulation's position, and tell it that a value of 400 is uh, a value of one. What you're actually gonna see is that only when they reach those specific markers uh, do they start to change color again. So see when we hit here, it starts to switch over. And that's kind of where things start to get interesting with Niagara because it lets you essentially move data around and rebind things wherever you want. It gives you a lot more control to artists without having to actually have a programmer on board to kind of engineer some of these things. And that's incredibly powerful. Now the final thing I'm gonna do while I'm on this emitter is I'm gonna go down to this section that says render. And I'm gonna point out that we actually can add extra renderers. So these, uh, with a sprite renderer, we're rendering little dots in space, okay? But what I actually wanna do here is I would love to render a light so that every single particle, pulling the same information at the end, but now these particles are kinda of having their own little rave out here. So this is working well, uh, but I want to put this particle system over here, and it's time for me to start doing something uh, a little bit more interesting. So let's go look for Crunch. Here he is. So Crunch is kind of stuck in this area. We have a cage all around him. So what I would love to do is I would love to use Niagara combined with the material editor in Unreal Engine to actually go ahead and make him dissolve through the fence so that he can turn into little nanoparticles whenever he reaches the fence and then reform on either side. So I think that effect is gonna be reasonably straightforward. So let's go ahead and punch that out now. I'm gonna close down my spinning particles and I'm gonna create another effect. Once again, to Niagara's system. It's gonna be using a standard boilerplate empty emitter to start with. And I'm gonna call this NS underscore uh, dissolve effects. Now for NS dissolve effect, what I need to do is start the same way. I need to add a spawn rate. And my spawn rate is gonna have a value of something a bit higher this time. Let's do, uh, let's do 80,000. Now I've set it to 80,000 and you're probably like, but Chris, my performance, why? And you know, uh, yeah, there could be some performance issue there, but we can get around that pretty quickly by just, instead of having this on the CPU, setting it to be on the GPU. And when we set it to be on the GPU, I'm also gonna give it fixed bounds. Now, I'm not really gonna get into this. Suffice to say that when an emitter exists on the GPU, uh, the engine doesn't actually know how big the emitter is. 
So what you need to do is basically hard code in the rough size of that so that it doesn't cull at inappropriate times. Anyway, that's now set to be a GPU emitter. But this time, instead of using a sphere as the particle spawn, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call reproduction. And you'll see that we actually have a great node here called initialize mesh reproduction. And if I check that, and then I set the preview mesh to crunch, it's actually recreating that entire mesh by covering it in all of these particles. And this is really valuable stuff because now that we're doing this, we can start to create something interesting. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like in the world. I'm going to hit save and I'm going to go to this character and I'm going to uh, add a component, which is going to be a Niagara particle system. And I'm going to set this to be the dissolve effect that we just created. And you'll see that uh, the engine actually auto fills any of those mesh references with the mesh that it's applied to if it's, uh, if it's a component of it. But here's the problem. I'm going to hit play and let's look at what it does. Not ideal. But what are we actually seeing here? Well, I'll tell you. The velocity of each of these particles is being maintained from its spawn position. So if its arm was moving up at the, in the animation at the time, that particle will just keep flying up. Now, fortunately, we have a great way of maintaining it. And that is that we can just type update and add an update mesh reproduction to our particle update loop. And again, I'm going to select this. Now, for anyone that's following at home, it's worth noting that if you have any issues at this point, it's potentially because uh, you may be getting an error that says that this mesh needs CPU access. And there should be a little checkbox for you to check that just says enable CPU access on the mesh. Anyway, now that we have this going on, let's look at what's happening. If I hit play, we can now see that those particles are actually adhering to the surface of crunch. Great. So the next thing for me to do is to get crunch and get these particles actually uh, properly reproducing the aesthetic of crunch. So we need them to actually have the same texture as the model that's beneath them. And that's actually pretty easy too. It just involves us creating our own, our own material. And I could right click and create my own this way, but what I think might be a better idea for me to do is to instead just grab the existing crunch material and use that as a reference. So I'm gonna get that and I'm gonna duplicate it. And I'm just going to call it crunch underscore Niagara underscore mat. Now crunch Niagara mat, I'm just going to call an extra node. So this is the material that we have set up for crunch. It's very straightforward for this asset. And I'm just going to connect this here. So what this material function does is it gets the particle mesh UVs of the specific area of crunch that we're looking at. And it tells these textures to show that part of crunch. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is this section down here that says modulate mesh normals. Now, all I need to do is multiply the normal by this value. I'm just going to plug that in. Okay. And now this would get us uh, mostly set up, but we are going to have a couple of issues here. So I'm going to hit apply and I'll show you what those issues are, and then we'll come back and we'll correct them. So I've hit apply, and now inside of here, set that to crunch. Uh, I'm going to go to my sprite, and I'm going to set this to be the crunch Niagara material that we just created. And we can see that it's compiling a Niagara version for the first time, so we'll give it just a minute to continue. Now, here's the first couple of issues that we can see. First off, they're all squares, and I would like to fix that. Next off, they're not actually adhering to the angle of the, the, uh, the character that we're looking at. Those squares are always facing us. Now, fortunately, that's actually pretty easy for us to solve. All I need to do is click on the sprite renderer and tell the alignment to be custom, since it's automatically being set by update mesh, and to set the facing mode to custom as well. And you'll see that they're now actually wrapping themselves around correctly. Cool. So with that done, the next thing that I want to do is I want to start getting these to no longer be squared. Fortunately, I can add a node to the material editor called Radial Gradient Exponential. And if we look at that, we can see that it's just a white circle that fades to black at the edges. And that's great, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be getting that. And I'm going to do a little technique that I'd like to do, which is multiplying the value by 2 and then subtracting a texture from it. 
and that's going to give me a bit of a noisy edge. And I'll show you what that looks like. So the existing version that we have, when it's just a radial, looks like that. But when we subtract the edges from it, we end up with something that looks like that. Now I'm going to get this value and I'm going to multiply it against particle color. So for anyone that's unfamiliar with it, particle color is a way of feeding in the color data from a Niagara or a Cascade system into a material. So I'm just going to say if you modify the alpha channel, modify that. At which point I'm going to saturate it, which is clamping it between 0 and 1 because I never want to go above 1 or below 0. And then I'm going to get this and I'm going to add a dither temporal AA. This is a nice little technique that means if you have a masked asset, it will actually blend in the mask areas without using translucency. Nice little tip and it works pretty well. So I've plugged this all in and the last thing to do is just plug the emissive color into that. Okay. Now I'm going to hit apply and we're going to go back to crunch and look at what he looks like back in the dissolve effect. All right. So that may not look like it's working, but it actually is. The trick is, is that this initialized particle node is setting the default color to white. And I'm just going to turn that back down to black so that it's the underlying diffuse. And that's working. We've now got the character able to be reproduced in particles. So this is good. This is fine. This is working. Uh, but what I would like to do is one other thing on this, which is I'm going to set this particle to be two sided. Now, with this character set up and all of the particles set to two sided so that they're correctly rendering, the next thing that I would like to do is I like to set this up so that the underlying material for Crunch goes invisible whenever it touches a wall. Because what we're going to do is make Crunch go invisible when he touches a wall and make the particles around the invisible area scatter and look like they're the bits that are flying around. And that's actually pretty easy to do. All I need to do is open up Crunch's material and we're going to access something called distance to nearest surface. Now distance to nearest surface is, is a really useful little node, but it's worth noting that it's only available if you have distance fields enabled. So you need to have generate mesh distance fields enabled. Now I've got this set up and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the distance to the nearest surface, but I want to fade depending on the distance to the nearest surface. And I want to have a band around me that uh, stays a certain color before it fades. So it kind of stays black before it fades to white. So to do that, it's actually pretty straightforward. Uh, let's say you have something that is 50 units away from you and you want to have a 30 centimeter band of the same color and a 20 centimeter distance fade. All you actually would need to do is subtract 30 and then divide it by 20 because 50 minus 30 is going to be 20 and then 20 divided by 20 is going to be a value of 1. So that kind of, uh, that basic math there is a really useful design pattern. I use it really frequently, but let's look at what we're doing here. I'm going to subtract 20, I'm going to divide it by 30, I'm going to hit Q to align the nodes, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to saturate it so that nothing is below zero or above one, and then I'm going to run this node called dither temporal AA. And we're going to do the exact same as before, where I plug it into the mask. I'm going to set this to be a masked particle. And now if I hit apply, let's go look at what Crunch now looks like in the world once this shader has finished compiling. Let's bring this character over here. Give it a quick look. Okay, we are working. So we can see here that this character has faded out around these edges. Got a nice range there, and the feet actually were, we just had a lot of particles that were doing it. So we now know that that part's invisible. The next step is for us to get these particles to separate to finish the effect, and that'll tie everything together, I promise. So let's see what that actually looks like. Well, uh, if I hit play, I run into it, we can see that he's fading. So I now need to figure out how do I do that material logic in the Niagara system? that's actually reasonably straightforward. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my dissolve effect and I need to create a way to blend between a physics crazy version and where the particles need to be. 
which means I need to have some sort of variable that I'm keeping track of that is going to be considered the current dissolve amount. So I'm going to go to my particle update and I'm going to create what is called a new scratch pad module. And I'm going to call this get level of dissolve. Now, if I go back to the system, you can see it's actually created a module for us called get level of dissolve. Now, what Scratchpad is, is it's basically a way of creating modules or dynamic inputs that only exist in this system. They're not assets that you save and share between everything. They're a great way to just kind of try things out, rough stuff up, and it's, it's really, really useful and incredibly powerful in a tech artist's utility belt. So I've got this, and I'm gonna now create some things. So the first thing I need to know is the distance to the surface. And fortunately, I can do that by creating a new collision query. So I'm gonna get this, and I'm gonna call on it, query mesh distance field GPU. And you'll see that this function is actually very similar. So I'm just gonna pull that across. This function is actually very similar to the one that we had in the material. But it does need to ask us a question. It needs to say, where in the world are we sampling? And that's actually pretty straightforward. I can add a vector, and I'm just gonna call this sample position. Now, a great little thing that we can do here is whenever you add an input, you can actually tell it to bind to a value. So if the developer doesn't actually set sample position, it will automatically be the particle's current position in space. So now that we've got that, we're gonna follow the exact same logic that we had before. I'm gonna subtract a number, and then I'm gonna divide a number. So let's set this up. And I'm gonna add, create new parameter. I'm gonna create a float. And I'm gonna call this bias. And I'm gonna add another float. And I'm gonna call this one distance. Wonderful. So we're now subtracting that and dividing it by that. So uh, with that in mind, all I need to do is what I did before, which is to clamp them so that we don't go above one or below zero. Cool. And the last thing I'm actually gonna do here is I'm gonna flip it. So at the moment, this goes from zero to one, but I really want my dissolve amount to be a value of one and my undissolve amount to be a value of zero. So I'm gonna plug that in as a one minus, and I'm gonna create a new output that is going to be a float, and it's gonna be called blend amount. Oh, how about dissolve amount? Now, one thing that's worth noting is that every time you create a parameter, it exists in a certain namespace. And that is that some things exist only in the particle space, in the output space, and transients. Uh, in this situation, we want to make sure that this information that we're setting is an output, which means that it's going to be something that other modules can actually access the information that this created. So I've now got this, and I'm going to set the same values as before of 20 and 30, so 20 and 30. You'll see sometimes that when you first create a collision query, it has a script value. I'm just gonna click that, which will automatically reset it. And in theory, that should be all we need for the level of dissolve. So if I was to go to this now, and I now need to blend the values. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is quickly correct something. The moment whenever we have this solve forces and velocity, its information is essentially getting, getting overridden by this update mesh reproduction. So I'm going to disable this value called write to intrinsic properties and just keep the mesh reproduction itself. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a lerp which will blend this information with this information according to this information. And that's really straightforward. Because first off, we need the alpha, and the alpha is a dissolve amount. And you'll see the value that we just created is available for us. Now, the next thing is the position. So we've got to think to ourselves, well, okay, what positions do we want? When there's no dissolve, then we want the update mesh position. And when there is a dissolve, 
we want to get the information that we didn't apply, but we did still calculate from the solve forces and velocity node. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the velocity down the bottom, and that is I'm going to say, hey, when the value is zero, I want you to be the update velocity. And when you are the velocity, I want you to have the solve forces velocity. And with those in place, I'm just going to add one tiny little thing to get a bit more chaos going on. And that is that I'm going to add the vortex velocity to all the way up here. Put it on a very low number, I'm thinking like 20. Cool. Now, I'm going to hit compile and save. Now, I'll give it just a second. Now, this may not look like it's doing much, but if you check out those feet, which are very close to the surface, they're dissolving into particles. And if I was to walk into here, we can see that this character is now splitting out into particles at that location. And if we focus on it, we can actually see that we can see through the character at the locations that he's pulling apart. So that's kind of cool. You know, we're getting somewhere. The last little thing that I'd love to do to finish off this effect, though, is to once again add the color. So I'm going to get the color and I'm going to add a curve. So the color from curve, uh, once again, instead of using the normalized value, I'm going to do something different. I think it'd be great if we looked at the dissolve amount. And we told these particles that when you are 0% dissolved, I want you to be black. So I, I want you to be completely invisible. And I want your emissive to be black as well. As you start to dissolve and fade away, I still want it to be black. But at some point, I would love for these particles to appear. And then let's, uh, let's, let's flash them a color. Let's go like a really bright green. And I'm then going to fade back to white at a distance. Ah, oh, you know, I might even fade back to black. That could look cool because they, I think that will get them kind of emissive. If we want to see how that's looking, I can get this character. Character, I'm going to pull it across. We can see here that those particles that are intersecting are kind of doing that. Let's see what that looks like in motion. May have gone a bit overboard on the uh, the brightness value there, so I might just uh, bring that dial that back just a little bit. I'm going to uh, bring this back to here really quick, so we just get a narrow band of it. Let's see how that looks. There you go. And there it is. Now we kind of get that like ghostly green at the uh, the merge point, but everything else is still trying to form itself. And that's all it takes to kind of get something that you've never made before in uh, in Niagara that you couldn't achieve in Cascade. So I, I hope this has been useful for everyone. I hope this has been a powerful session. And I really hope that everyone kind of looks at this and continues to make some really outstanding stuff in Niagara with Unreal Engine 4.25 and beyond. Thank you very much for your time.